In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. It's funny, I, I, I met with this young man um, who um, was a spiritual pilgrim and he wanted to um, investigate our church and he thought uh, that he would make a decision about what he after a period of some years. It's an amazing kind of thought because people are impetuous and so therefore the decisions that they make are and unfirm because they haven't given enough time for consideration. But here was somebody, and he's from a Protestant bat, and I myself have a Protestant bat. Though I know some of the things are regularly thrown at our face, um, insult, but more than insult, things that really capture a real thing. This does what has here. And it harkens back to the Testament. It brings the Old Testament to the New as the Lord Jesus Christ, in his incarnation, brought the Old and the New Testament into one body. But the people don't have enough edge of zoom. They don't understand what's going on. It's not that there are a dearth of books. Uh, it used to be the case that you could complain with some um, credibility that you couldn't put your hands on a book. But now with the internet, every day, there isn't anybody that should be ignorant about what's done. But think about the last thing that we prayed in the gospel of Luke, and and by the way, I want you to, uh, I, I want to thank you in advance for bearing with my laryngitis. <laughs> it's horrible enough to have to listen to me, but to have to listen to me when the radio station isn't tuned in well is even worse. It's written by the hand of Luke that no one desires immediately the new. They say the old is better. The old is better. Think about the history that you know. I mean, for me, I have 64 years of it, and I can, I can cull lessons from many decades of living experience. But I remember just when Glasnost and Perestroika came on uh, the scene, and uh, you had many people who, although the conditions of the old Soviet system were for the most part intolerable. It was secure, and many people were afraid, and they didn't want, they didn't want what was, uh, what was coming. And, and, and um, so it is with um, most things today that we find comforting simply because there's ample evidence of familiarity. The church is a familiar thing. But when you don't know the church, we become a relic. We become a thing that's no longer in use, but something that's in a museum. And being in a museum, we look at it and we wonder at it. There's a great uh, short story uh, by the woman who wrote um, Color Me Purple. Alice Walker is her name. And it's called Everyday Use. This woman had two daughters and uh, one of the daughters was exactly like the mother. The mother was described as a woman who could slaughter a hog, put a liver, put the hog's bleeding liver on a stick, put it over a fire, and eat it. Her sister was this way. She was a little adult-brained, wasn't that smart. The other sister was described as getting out of a BMW with a long, slender leg stylishly dressed and she had come to get a quilt a quilt you, you may or may not know this some quilts are worth tens of thousands of dollars now the idea of getting this quilt was she was going to hang it on a wall the BMW uh, daughter the other daughter with the bib overalls and the, the boots and the kerchief, that daughter, she was going to put it on her bed. And the younger daughter was horrified. How could this be done? 
this is worth so much and you're going to use it up. But you see, the, Im the implements that we have in museums were made for everyday use. And our church is meant for everyday use. So we don't have a book of memories. We have a living testimony of our God. We do not have merely the sayings of some old men with long beards, but we have the fathers of the church who have taken the mysteries of the gospel and made them clear in a living framework of monasticism. We have brought and to bear our faith on governments and seen them fall. It is a living testimony. It is a living church, but only living in the hands of us who are alive. The rest are dead. Nietzsche said famously, God is dead, you killed him. And yes, we kill God, we kill our church, we kill our history, we kill everything, and we become a museum of curiosity. Look at these people in their passion play. Look at these people walking around. It's like the clockwork in a very uh, highly embellished German timepiece or Swiss timepiece. And it goes around and there are little trains and little marching soldiers and then at the end somebody will come out and give a salute or a bird will come out and go cuckoo. But they sell for a lot of money. So do we. We invest our time. We invest our. We invest everything. We invest our lives. We baptize our children. We give them. We give them to this. Uh, to this basin, to this font, and they look at me terrified as I dump them in water. Not knowing, but receiving. And they live in. That's why in this church, above all other churches, parents and relatives of children are not allowed to speak. If you correct a small child, as you should, or you prevent a small child from hurting himself or destroying property, you do so non-verbally. The child is the only one who is allowed to speak in this church. The only one. And it's because they're probably the most alert to the things that are going on all around us, but that we have merely become too blind to see. There are angels. I confess there are angels, as the church confesses there are angels. I also confess never to having seen one. I've seen them depicted only. And I blame myself. I must be, I must be um, of too coarse a material. I, I, I must be too, too poorly refined, not subtle enough for one of these creatures. I, I must be too gross in my manner for them to be present in my company. Uh, because others have seen them. And I am certain that babies see these things. I am certain. So, here you have the Lord Jesus Christ. And he very ironically says, sometimes we, we, we don't think about the Lord as having anything but a flat affect. There was no humor. I mean, there's a little bit of rage, we imagine, when he's, you know, driving the money changers from his father's temple. But imagine him saying to any group of people, I didn't come to those who are well. The well do not need a doctor. I did not come to the righteous. Because the righteous do not need someone to correct them. They are, in fact, their own truth. Uh, who can stand and hear this voice? This voice. What it must have been like. 
You know how you respond to certain voices? Everybody knows my grandson is the apple of my eye. When he speaks to me and he says a little, little word, poorly pronounced, it enters into my heart with such ease. I can't begin to tell you. Now imagine the Savior of the world coming to his own children and speaking a word to them and then the children stiffening. It is so inhumane as it's written in the Gospel of John, he came unto his own and his own received him not. It's so inhumane. But this is what was called. So he says ironically to them, you are, you are well, you are not sick. You are righteous, you are not sinners. How can anyone sit and allow that to be said of them at any time? You are righteous. We may be self-righteous, but we are not righteous. And then they ask, why are your disciples happy? <laughs> we're not happy. We're miserable. We're miserable. In Christianity, the core of life should be joy. And it is the type of joy that is maintained through the prayer of thanksgiving. You know, everybody's grandmother, I mean mine, specifically, always used to say, count your blessings, child. Count your blessings, child. I got, you know, I would say, count my blessings, you know. I, I said, well, I remember, uh, when was I blessed last? I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. I do now. Chocolate pudding is a blessing. The fact that I can taste and differentiate from all other puddings in the world, tapioca, butterscotch, vanilla, and I can taste chocolate pudding, that is a blessing. Well, who made me? Who made me to receive that blessing? The Lord has done countless things for which we should be thankful that I am ambulatory, that, 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 that I have that I have the intellect to be able to present my thoughts fluidly. It's a great blessing. I can make contact with other minds. There's so many things that are available to me through the blessing of God. And these people are unhappy. There is Jesus. He's a constant. And here are the variables, his disciples and the Jews. One group happy, one not happy. Living faith demands certain things from us. It demands, first of all, that we forgive. We forgive. Then, we have a right to go to our Father and expect acceptance. To expect it. Because in the prayer that He gave us, He reminds us, you will be forgiven your trespasses as you forgive those who have trespassed against you. So the first thing that we learn to do is to forgive. But then we look around at all of the things that we enjoy and start with the little things. I'm fat, I love to eat, so food is near the top of my list on all things. I can eat when I don't feel well, I can eat when I feel well, I can eat all the time, I have to eat all the time. And I'm lucky enough to always find something that tastes good. I've just rediscovered iced tea. I haven't had iced tea in about 10 years. And I just got some iced tea. And it just tasted so good. Now, it's a common thing, isn't it? Isn't it? I, except perhaps in countries where refrigeration, you know, is, is still, you know, uh, a great luxury. But it's, it's so small. I mean, my wife, God bless her, she brings into our home all the time cut flowers 
for the icon that we have of St. Mary. And as you pass by, she likes stargazers, she likes lilac, she likes honeysuckle. She, she, it gives a nice odor to the room. You walk by and go, ah, oh, well, God made that. Thank you, Lord. It starts off like that. And then your joy becomes replete. Because as the small things incrementally stack up, like the limestone drip from a cave into a stalactite, and you get this accretion of being thankful, being responsive to the good in the world, and you live with joy. And so getting a good watermelon is a source of joy. I hit a home run. Sometimes you get watermelon at... It's, it's really like uh, like red cucumber. It doesn't have any more flavor than a cucumber. It's just red in color. You know? But sometimes you get a watermelon, and it's a watermelon. Or a peach is a peach. You know, blueberries are, are wonderful. Um, I say these things because they're accessible to all of us, even the poor. Cool, clear drinking water when you're really thirsty, how it takes care, how it takes care of almost everything you need. So the Jews were unhappy in the presence of the one who brings peace, tranquility, joy, patient endurance, who brings gentleness, meekness, kindness, faith, Temperance brings all these things. They're miserable in his company. There are people who are miserable in the church. They come to church as a reflection of a kind of cultural imperative. If I want to be with a bunch of Egyptians, then I better be where the Egyptians congregate. And I've only got the two choices. Shisha and church. And it's a terrible thing, but it's, it's where folks meet most of the time. But the ones who are alive and the ones who have joy are the ones who have a meaningful and deep relationship with the Lord. And it's for that reason that the Lord characterizes the joy that we have and the joy that we experience is it at the same level of being with one who is about to be wed, about to take his wife, about to have union with the apple of his desire, the one who is going to start a life, who will have a house and build a house, and have children as the expected fruit of the vine, and all of that, and everyone Everyone is pleased. I, I, I hope um, I hope it never it never comes to pass that although an epithet may be thrown our way, that it is ever ever true that we have become simply a museum. Glory be to our God, both now and ever and unto the age of all ages. Amen.